Okay, so today we're going to continue in this series, uh, Five Ways to a Five-Star New Year. Last week, we talked about how breaking up our relationship with worry and taking up a relationship with God can be a good first step towards a five-star new year. Today, we're going to talk about uh, temptation, temptation. So I know I've told you before that when I was a kid, uh, me and my brothers, a lot of times we had a lot of work to do around the ranch. And I remember one uh, time, my brother and I, I was probably 10, he was 8 or so, uh, my dad had given us a job for the day, he'd given us a pile of wood that we needed to split before he came home from town. So we went down the barn, we had this pile of wood, and we watched his car, you know, go down that long driveway to the road, and we started, you know, splitting the wood, but it wasn't too long before we noticed that it was a really beautiful day out. And uh, we started talking about how wonderful it would be to go down to the windmill. Now, the windmill was on another part of the property down across by the creek. Uh, so, we, you know, we worked for a little while more. But then we thought, you know, we probably should take a little break. So we went down past the barn. We went across this creek went to the windmill and stood there looking at the real source of our fascination with this place, and that was the old well. Now, there was a well there. It was about five feet in diameter, about 40 feet deep, and it was covered with this heavy wooden uh, cover, plank cover. Now, the reason we were fascinated with this well was uh, we'd seen inside it before, and we knew. Now, during the night, oftentimes, little animals, like rats and snakes and things like that, would be attracted by the smell of the water in the well, and they would, at night, go there and crawl up underneath that wooden cover, and then before they knew what hit them, they would have fallen into the well to their deaths. Now, I don't know if I'm just weird, but at least in my day, for an 8- and 10-year-old boys, there was nothing more fascinating and enticing than the thought of looking at carcasses of dead animals in a well. So, even though, of course, we were told never to go near the well, and certainly never to open it unless someone was there, within moments, me and my little brother were just pushing this wooden top, you know, this cover over and let it fall down. And uh, to our delight, of course, we saw that there were shapes in the water. So we laid down, we kind of inched our way towards the edge of this well, because we knew it was dangerous. I mean, we were being very careful. We got our heads over that well, and we're looking into that dark water. We're like, oh, look, man, yeah, that's a, that's a snake. Look how long that thing is. Oh, oh, and that's a rat. Said, no, no, that's not a rat. That's that's a squirrel. That thing has fallen apart. That's decom... You know, all of those things in these hushed tones. But all of a sudden, we heard this scream. And the scream was us because we felt two hands on our waistbands pulling us back. And our shirts are flying up. You know, we're being scraped across the weeds. We turn around on our back. And there's my dad. And he is livid. No, suffice to say, we hightailed it back down to the barn, and suffice to say, there was a paddle up on top of the refrigerator, and as hard as we worked on that pile of wood that day, that paddle got to work out that night before dinner, because we had been tempted, and tempted into a situation that could have been really dangerous, but for the strong arms of my father finding us and pulling us back. Well, that's what temptation does to us. Temptation entices us, it lures us into physically, sometimes spiritually, always, emotionally, sometimes dangerous situations, harmful situations for ourselves and for others. Now, Temptation comes in all kinds of forms. It can come in those really strong and powerful temptations that draw people into addictions, 
alcohol, drugs, sex, you name it, things that can really enslave a person. Temptation also comes to us, though, and most of the time, I think, comes to us in those little things, those little temptations, those little sins that are corrosive over time, corrosive to our characters. But always, 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 temptation draws us away from God, draws us away from God. Temptation makes us believe that what we know is wrong is right for us at that moment. And then temptation laughs at us. When we are sitting there on the other side of sin with nothing but just a handful of regret over what we've done and then some weak promises that we're never going to succumb to that temptation again until next time. Temptation is dangerous. Temptation is dangerous. So it's good to watch out for. So where does it come from? Well, we know where it does not come from. Because James, the brother of Jesus, tells us in the book of James, he says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God is 100% holy. There's nothing about sin that's attractive to God. And there is no circumstance under which God would tempt us. However, God does test us. And I want to bring that up because so often we make the mistake of thinking temptation and testing is synonymous. They're not the same thing. God will never tempt us. Sometimes He will test us. But the difference between temptation and testing is in the purpose. The purpose. I'm going to give you an example that I thought was helpful to me. Um, the Ford Motor Company tests its cars, right? They test their cars, and they test them for a certain purpose. They test them to see uh, their strengths. They test them to approve what they have built. They test them to see those cars succeed at the test. But Ford Motor Company also tests Chevys, and they test Chevys for the opposite reason to see the weaknesses in those cars, and to see them fail. That's the difference between what God does for us in testing us and what Satan does, the devil does, in tempting us. God tests us in order that our faith might be approved, that we might understand our own commitment and also strengthen our faith. God tests us to see us succeed. The devil tempts us always in order to bring us to misery and to failure. But God tests, and he tests to see us succeed. The devil tempts us to failure. Now, the most famous, I think, test that God gives in the Bible is the test given to Abraham in chapter 22 of Genesis. And we know this is a test because the Bible says so. It says, later God tested Abraham. Now, Abraham had a son, you remember, named Isaac. And this son Isaac was given to Abraham with the express purpose that he would be the progenitor of this great nation. Through Isaac, God promised he would create a great nation. Nation. Nonetheless, one day God tested Abraham, saying, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will tell you about. So even though Abraham knows that this is a crazy kind of request coming from God, whom he knows is going to create a great nation through Isaac. Still, Abraham obeys. He takes his son, his only son, to the top of this mountain. He builds an altar. He binds his son to that altar. And just as he brings his hand back to strike his son, 
God stays his hand. And God says, now I know that you fear, respect, obey God. Now, this test wasn't so that God could figure out if Abraham was really faithful, but it was to approve Abraham's faith so that Abraham would know the depth of his own commitment, the depth of his own faith. By this experience, Abraham's faith was strengthened and made ready for all that would come. God tested Abraham to approve his faith, to see him succeed. Now, we have these tests in our own lives. They may be hard to recognize sometimes, but let's just say you have an opportunity to talk to someone about your faith. Someone comes to you, maybe they're, 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 they're struggling somehow, and you have an opportunity to tell them about the God you serve, the God who's changed your life. That's a test by which our faith can be strengthened and deepened and approved. It's a test that God wants to see us Succeed, be successful at. On the other hand, when my brother and I went to that well, drawn by temptation, it was for no other reason but to be drawn to sin, to break the promise, to make liars of us, break the promise we'd made to our dad that we were going to finish that work, to lead us into disobeying him, to lead us to the precipice of what could have been A terrible tragedy for our whole family that could have reverberated down through generations. That's what Satan likes to do. And guess who would have been laughing had it not been for my dad showing up and pulling us back from the brink. So God wants to see us succeed. God wants to see us succeed in his tests. Satan wants to see us fail. But the thing about it is this. Our reaction, our response to a test of God or to a temptation of of the devil is the same. It should always be the same. To obey God, right? To obey God. It's very simple. Whether it's a test of God, whether it's a temptation of the devil, obey God. God. And ironically, no matter what temptation the devil throws at us, if we obey God, well, we turn that temptation into a test, into an approval of our faith, something that's going to deepen our faith. So how is it that we can begin this year to walk away to defeat temptation, especially those temptations that have come to us over and over and over again, and maybe we succumb to over and over again. How can we begin to beat those things? Well, the first thing I think we need to do when faced by a temptation, especially a temptation that's recurring, is to confess it. Confess it to God. Lift it up to God. Name that temptation by name. And I say name it out loud. It's important to name that thing out loud. Let your mouth say it and your ears hear it. For saying the name of that temptation demystifies it. It robs it of some of its power, don't we agree? It robs it of its power. So we name that temptation. We say it out loud. We put it out there and confess it to God. But the second thing, we need to remember, we can't just say it and then say, oh God, I've got this temptation and oh God, help me with it. Amen. We need to get detailed about it. We need to talk about it, discuss it with God. Take time to talk about our history with that temptation. How long has that temptation been dogging us? How many times have we succumbed to it? What happened when we did? Talk to God, and I mean talk out loud. Rehearse the history of your life with that temptation. Really get into it with God, and then when that temptation comes up again, 
you renew that conversation. One of the big mistakes that we make with temptation, I think, is that when it comes, the first thing we feel is shame, and we start to turn away from God. There's the worst thing we can do. That's the moment where we need to turn towards God and know that we've had this conversation with Him already about it and jump right back into that conversation when we face temptation again. So we want to confess to God. Our temptation. The second thing, if we can, we want to find a trusted friend in Christ, a trusted Christian friend or pastor to whom we can uh, reveal that temptation and speak about that temptation and our struggle with it. When we do that, we're suddenly opening up the circle. We're taking something that we're holding it in shame and letting control us, and we're throwing it out, sharing it with one other person so that that person can now become an ally in our struggle with that temptation, can pray for us, can pray with us, and mostly maybe can be a person for, to whom we can be accountable when we're struggling with that temptation, when we take that two steps forward and one step back that's so much a part of these struggles. We can talk with that person, and that person will be there to support us and help us through. So if we really want to defeat temptation, especially a recurring temptation, we want to confess, and we want to confess. But the third thing, and oftentimes this will come out of that process of talking to God and talking to others, the third thing we need to do, and it's probably the most important, we need to get honest with ourselves about our true desire. Do we really want to defeat that temptation? Do we really want to be delivered of that temptation? So often, as I said last week about having a relationship with worry, so often we can have a relationship with a certain temptation or a certain sin that we've actually grown kind of fond of. We need to ask ourselves and be honest. Do we really want to be delivered from that temptation? Or is it something that we've kind of fallen in love with? Lust is probably one of the most common and most powerful of temptations, especially for men. And it can come in lots of forms, lust of the eyes, pornography, and different sorts of performances live and on the Internet. Lust of our thoughts, even uh, lust that comes in uh, reverie, you know, memories of things that have gone on before. If it's a powerful temptation like that, or any temptation, we really first have to ask ourselves, look, is it true that I love that temptation more than I love God today? Is it the truth that really I take more pleasure in that temptation than I do in the thought of being delivered from it and obeying God? If we can't answer yes to that question, we will never, ever, ever. We can confess all we want. We can confess over here. If we can't answer yes to that question, we will never, ever, ever do the one thing that we must do if we're going to be delivered from temptation, and that is flee from it. Flee from it. That means turning away from those situations, getting out of those places where that temptation is going to arise, and sometimes it's even going to mean removing ourselves from the people who facilitate that temptation. But eventually, we have to ask that question, do I really want to be delivered? And if so, we need to say, yes, I do, and I'm going to flee from that temptation. Here's the good news, though. Once we can say yes, that we really want to be delivered, and once we can start making those efforts to turn away from temptation, guess who will be by your side to help you? And that is Jesus himself. Jesus gives us the power to be able to turn away from those temptations that dog us, that cause us suffering, and cause suffering to those around us. 
God can't help us. Jesus can't help us. James, the brother of Jesus, he says this. He says, each one of us is tempted when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. And isn't that what it's like when we are struggling with temptation, just being dragged away? No, no, don't take me. Being dragged away and enticed. But here's what Paul tells us. No matter how we're being dragged, okay? <laughs> no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. There is no temptation that we are going to face this year. There is no temptation to which we may succumb this year that hasn't been had by somebody else, that hasn't been experienced by somebody else and defeated by somebody else. Hello? Amen. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Can I say that again? But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up to it. Oh, I'm being dragged away. Help, help. Guess who's standing right next to you? Even when you're in the midst of the evil one dragging you, Christ is next to you. Here's the way out. Let's go. Here's the way. Christ provides a way. We can defeat temptation, even those temptations that have been dogging us for a long, long time. We can defeat them. We listen. We obey. We turn our hearts to Him. That way we are definitely going to be on our way to a five-star new year. Next week we're going to continue this uh, series. We're going to be looking at uh, how God really wants us to catch a break. And the reason He wants us to catch a break is because what's good enough for God ought to be good enough for us. We're going to be talking about taking a Sabbath next week. But this week, let's remember what Paul said. This is what he said. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved not only from the consequences of sin in eternity, but from temptation now. Rescued from temptation now. It can be so harmful to you and harmful to others. So let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's beat temptation and move into a five-star new year together. Amen?